Thanks for joining our YouTube channel. If you haven't done so already, please click that subscribe button to join our community. That way you get notified each and every week a message pops up. With that being said, we pray that this message encourages and inspires you to take one step closer to Jesus. So, so men's retreat was, was so much fun. It was so good. Uh, one of the fun things that always happens at men's retreat is, is the, the fact that our church is very diverse, if you haven't noticed. Not just uh, black-white, but ethnicities from around the world are all in our church. And so you get people that are playing sports they've never played before. So, uh, you know, there's a guy, uh, Leonidas. He's from Greece. Leonidas is awesome. Is he in here right now? He'll be in next service maybe. Is he, is he here? Oh, he's up in the balcony. Oh, he's in the balcony. I can't see the balcony hardly. There's Leonidas up there. I love it, man, because Leonidas comes up to a baseball bat, and he's like, I've never held a baseball bat in my life. We don't play baseball in Greece, you know what I mean? Um, uh, and he did great, man. He did great. He did great. And, uh, and watching different things, like uh, Pastor George on his first youth retreat, uh, he, hit, he hit the ball, an elephant ball. He hit the ball and then carried the bat all the way to first, not realizing <laughs> you're not supposed to carry the bat to first. Um, you know, you get that kind of stuff. Pratyash this year played basketball for the first time in his life. He's never played basketball in his life. So he says, how do you play this game? And Pastor Josh said, you guard, you know, somebody, you put your arms out, you keep them from getting to the goal. Never played basketball in his life. Comes in, immediately just dominates on defense. Nobody can get around Pratyash. He gets done with the game, goes to Pastor Josh and says, so what do you call this game? What do you call this? He's like, it's called basketball, <laughs> right? Uh, it, it's always fun. Uh, to be a part of stuff like that and, and uh, first-time experiences. It's also funny because the same kind of thing happens in languages. Have you ever gone to another country where they speak a language other than yours? And all you, all you bilingual Spanish, English, then you have to go to like India or China or something, you know. Uh, when you go to a country where they speak a language different than yours, similar things happen because you feel completely odd and weird. And um, the same thing with sports. Like I was in um, a Latin American country one time with a group of our church people, and we got killed in soccer football uh, by like 10 year olds um, because they played all their life right and so but you get these language barriers like people will talk and you're like I hope they're not talking about me I don't know what they're saying I just hope they're not talking about me uh, you see funny things when you go on trips like that too with the language barriers um, uh, there was a, a great man of God he's with the Lord now but a, a kind of a hero of mine that I was on a mission trip with years ago knows no Spanish whatsoever and and we were in um Mexico, I'm trying to think where we were in that trip. We were in Mexico, and, uh, and, and we had had leftover food from where we were giving it out to people. And so we had these bags, and it was probably 20, 30 bags left over. And so the, the missionary said, just go in the streets and just, just talk to people and hand them out and just give them to whoever, right? And so this, this guy walks up to people, knowing no Spanish, and he says, ole. <laughs> ole. And these blessed Spanish ladies look at him, and they're like, Ole! And so they just reply back, Ole! <laughs> they don't know what language he's speaking either, so I think he meant to say hola, but um, it was hilarious to watch. Uh, one of the funniest ones that ever happened, I'm going to tell on Pastor Josh for a second. Uh, he was with me on a trip years ago to Colombia. We were in Bogota, Colombia, doing a pastor's conference, and uh, this is back when Pastor Josh was young and not married and, 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 and all this, and and uh, we were always trying to set him up. You know how that is. We were always trying to set him up with a girl. Praise God, he finally found Kat. Um, but we were always trying to set him up with a girl. So we're on this missions trip, and there are all these, like, college age, his age at that time, college age girls on this, on, you know, that are there for this pastor's conference. And so we kept teasing Josh. You're like, you know, you should check out one of these Colombian girls. You know what I mean? Like, they might be the one for you, right? And so then it became this little bit of a joke. And so Josh is like, yeah, all these girls like me, because they literally would follow him around. It was, it was the funniest thing. And so they're following Josh around everywhere. And so he would say things out loud, going, all these girls like me. Yeah, they can't get enough of me. Like, just teasing, obviously but they can't get enough of me, da, 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 until one of them started speaking to him in English. <laughs> and he then began to realize that they all spoke English because they had learned it in school and at least knew enough to know what he was saying, which was hilarious. And I don't think he will ever live that down. And so you got to be careful what you, what you say, right? And if you're ever, here's a, here's a truth statement for you. If you're ever going to survive in another culture, then you have to learn the language. In fact, I'd, I'd take it a step further. Say, if you're going to thrive in another culture, if you're really going to exceed in another culture, you have to know the language of that culture in order to succeed. Uh, Becca's right here beside me, and, and she's going down to Chile and, and as a missionary, and has been uh, to Uruguay already as a missionary. But before she can go and really do any missions work, she's got to learn 
Spanish. And not just, not just where's the bathroom, come on, y'all. Um, you know, she's got to learn enough Spanish that she can actually uh, work inside of those areas. And so the first thing we do with missionaries is we send them to the language school. Um, but the same thing happens in life. If, if you're going to sur- not just survive, but thrive, if you're going to excel, if you're going to do well, you have to learn the language of where you're going. So this brings to mind a great question. What is the language of heaven? What is the language of God? And you could also ask the adverse question, what is the language of the enemy? What is the language of the devil? Now, now uh, as a person who, who uh, is a wannabe philosopher and I have a degree in philosophy and apologetics, uh, and they teach you there that, that the language of God is logic. That's the language of God. That sounds so impersonal to most of us. Other people would say uh, the language of God is worship. Uh, I'm going to make a quick argument that the language of God is truth. Because you cannot even worship God unless it's in truth. Logic, by its nature, is a fundamental element of truth. If it's logically true, that's important. If it's illogical, then it's... So it's not just logic. It's not just what you worship. It's truth. Some people say the language of God is faith. Well, faith is only as good as it's in a true thing. You can have faith in a non-true thing, and that faith is worthless. So I would, I would argue quickly that the language of God is faith. And if that's the language of God, then the language of the enemy begins to be lies. Or I'm, I said faith a second ago. I meant to say truth. The language of God is truth. And if the opposite is true, then the language of the enemy, the language of the devil is lies. Now, now John is the youngest of the followers of Jesus Christ. He lived way longer than all the other followers of Jesus Christ as well. And later on in his life, he began to sit down and write down his own biography of Jesus's life. And so he sits down and, and he's heard all the other biographies by this point. In fact, there's some funny little things about it with that. Um, but he, he, he begins to write down and write his biography of Christ. And, and in John chapter 8, he's quoting Jesus Christ and he says this, John 8, 44 through 45. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He's a murderer from the beginning, holding not to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the what? Father of lies. So his language, according to Jesus, is lies. If you are speaking lies, you will thrive in the kingdom of hell. If you are sharing and spreading lies, you are speaking the language of hell. Hmm. Yet because I tell you the truth. So Jesus is saying, I am speaking the truth. The enemy, the devil is speaking lies he says, because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. I could go a little bit further in John in 14, 6, and Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I, I want to submit to you as we start this series that we are in a cosmic internal battle between lies and truth. Between which kingdom you're going to actually thrive in and work in. And you're in this internal battle. Internal battles are a lot harder than physical battles. I think it's easier to fight somebody physically than it is to fight them intern- fight internally. Internally, you, don't, you end up fighting with yourself, and, and the struggle is very real, and, and it's back and forth, these internal thoughts you have, and you don't know which ones you listen to and which ones you don't listen to. And I think it's easier sometimes to fight externally than to actually deal with the internal fight between truth and lies within ourselves. So... As we set up this series, let me get you started right off the bat. The lies we believe start to become the spiders that create intricate webs within our lives. The lies we believe are like spiders that create intricate webs inside of our lives. So, so what are you talking about? Let, let, me, let me give you an idea. Now, um, the, the foundation for this message, not really a lot that we're doing with it, but the foundation of this message comes from this book right here, Kill the Spider by Carlos Whitaker. 
Uh, great book. I highly recommend you get it, read it. It's, it's really, it's a very easy read. Uh, I read it in a day and a half or so. Uh, it's a very easy read. It's a fun read. Um, and it's his story of killing spiders. But it becomes a foundation for what we're talking about. I almost bought the book and bought a bunch of them for people to, to buy here and, and sell to you, um, you know, uh, for folks in our church. But, but the last couple times we've done that, we end up with a lot of books left over. So, hey, go to Amazon, go to, you know, wherever you want to go and, and get the book. But it starts all the way back with his father telling him a story. I want to read it to you real quickly to create a foundation for this whole series. This is his father talking to Carlos, and he says this. When I was early in my ministry in Panama, I was preaching a three-day revival in a small church by the ocean. The first night I preached mi corazón out. He's Spanish, okay. I preached hard and loud. Many were touched by God. Toward the end of the invitation, Mrs. Rodriguez, or Miss Rodriguez, stood up in the second row. She made her way to down the center aisle and walked very slowly toward the front. When she finally got to me, I asked Miss Ramirez why she had come. Her answer was simple. Pastor, I need you to pray that the Lord cleans the cobwebs out of my life. I have so many cobwebs. Could you please pray, she asked me. And so I obliged. I prayed the Lord would clean the cobwebs out of her life. She thanked me and went on her way. On night two of the revival, I saw her get up again. Miss Rodriguez, she came walking down the aisle with a little more certainty. Pastor, could you please pray again? Could you please pray again that the Lord cleans out the cobwebs out of my life? She asked. I reminded her that I had prayed the night before for the very same thing and that the Lord would honor our prayer, but she insisted that I pray again. So I did. Our father, Miss Rodriguez, is obviously uh, very concerned at, the, at this state in her life. Would you please help her clean out her life so that she can honor the, her, the, honor you the best with it? Please co- clean the cobwebs out of her life, he prayed. Son, listen to me. The, he's talking to his son in here. The last night of the revival, I couldn't believe it. She got up again. She made her way down the aisle even faster this night. I wondered if she was going to tell me that her life had begun to take a turn for the better. That the Lord began to work and clean out the cobwebs in her life. Pastor Furman, Pastor Furman, please, one last time, can you please pray that the Lord cleans the cobwebs out of my life? I stopped her in mid-sentence. I stopped her because I realized that we were praying the wrong prayer. And so I prayed, Father, we do not ask you tonight to clean the cobwebs out of Miss Rodriguez's life. In fact, Lord, keep them there for now. But tonight we ask you to do something much greater. Tonight we ask you to kill the spider and risk Miss Ramirez's life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This becomes the foundation for what I want us to see. And that is that we are often cleaning cobwebs in our life when the real issue is the spider. If you have ever found yourself in a, in a sin pattern where you find yourself doing the same thing over and over, you make the same mistakes over and over and over, falling for the same temptations over and over and over, making the same bad decisions over and over and over. Now you're on your fifth marriage, right? Now you are, and you end up in these same patterns over and over. Maybe the issue isn't just the pattern. Maybe the issue goes to a root thing A lie that you have believed that needs to be dealt with so that the cobwebs now come out of your life once and for all. Are y'all with me? So how do we do this? To remove webs uh, permanently, we must remove the spider. You got to get to the very root thing. What's causing the webs in the first place? What's causing these patterns to show up in your life over and over and over in the first place? What sort of uh, uh, things are, are, are these patterns in your life? So, so here's a question. When, when I talk about these webs, the Holy Spirit will sometimes alert you to things. What are the patterns? What are the webs in your life that the Lord is going to deal with you during this whole series about? That when we get done with these series, you're no longer trapped in this pattern. You're going to actually move forward without it. In fact, this may be a moment where our Sozo ministry has more people backlogged to get in than ever before. Because Sozo ministry specifically deals with lies that we've accepted and believed and have allowed to come in that create patterns inside of our lives. It goes back to those lies and replaces them with truth, but I'm probably getting ahead of myself slightly. Here's the thing. Every sin pattern that we have in our lives, every, every Every sin pattern that we have inside of our lives starts with a a lie that we've believed and usually partnered with. 
So not only have I believed it, I have accepted it as my truth, as truth in this instance. So if you are, 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 are a person that's full of rage, there's a lie behind it. If you find yourself constantly having road rage on the road, there's a lie behind it that we believe somewhere. If you are a person that struggles with alcohol or drug addiction, there's a lie behind it somewhere that's why it keeps coming up. And you ask God, forgive me, God, heal me. And it keeps coming up because we're cleaning out cobwebs. We're not actually dealing with the root cause, the spider. I've said for years, uh, I feel like many times in the church, what we do is we manicure the weeds in our life instead of pulling them out. As long as, I, as long as I use the weed eater and I take the weeds and bring them down low, nobody notices the weeds that are in my flower bed and in my garden. And, and you don't notice it. So what we do in the church is instead of actually pulling it out by the root, we just manicure it and keep it down so it doesn't look bad for everybody else to see. Are y'all with me? And so, so if it's greed or codependency or unbelief or pornography or abuse, whatever it is, the sin patterns that we have in our lives, if we don't get to the root of it, which is always a lie somewhere, if we don't get to the root of it, it's going to keep showing back up time in and time out again. And so we end up playing this game of the, the biggest liar, the biggest uh, 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 hider within the church where we just clean stuff out, pretend it's not there. Clean stuff out, pretend it's not there so nobody else can see it. We want to get past that during this series. Um, and these, these believed lies, man, they, they, they always end up affecting us somehow. Um, when we partner with a lie, uh, it could be a great effect, it could be a small effect, but they always end up affecting us somehow because now we're partnering with the wrong kingdom. We're speaking the language of the wrong kingdom. And you don't want to be bi bilingual in this instance, right? Um, and so it always ends up affecting us somehow. You, you ever like walk through a spider web? Isn't that like the worst thing, like ever? Like, I, I don't, that, that might be like torture. Like, I don't know what they do in Guantanamo Bay, but maybe they just make people walk through spider webs because that is absolutely the worst. You walk through a spider web. You ever watch somebody when they walk through a spider web, or maybe it's you. You instantly go into a tantrum, and you're, you're you know, you, you're, you're like going nuts. And then have you ever noticed this? Even if you feel like you got the spider web off of you now, you still feel it for hours. You're like, it's, I can't see it, but it's there. I know, I know it's there. And, and you can't see it, but you feel, this is what happens. We get in this web of lies, and it affects us. All of a sudden, you're throwing tantrums that you were never meant to throw. All of a sudden, you're freaking out with road rage while there's somebody else that's perfectly calm in the middle of the same traffic. Why, why are you the one freaking out? Maybe you have a spider going on in the background. Maybe there's a web that we're caught up in that's causing us to act a certain way that we don't need to be acting. Because that's what they do. They start to control us. They make us act out. So let me give you some examples. We're going to really touch down during this series a lot on specific ones. But let me give you some examples. Because I think sometimes we end up with a wolf spider in sheep's clothing lurking within our lives. Okay? Um, I'll give you a few, few examples. How about this one? How about this lie? I'm not good enough. Many men, including myself, this is one that we deal with. I'm not good enough. It actually goes all the way back to the very first sin. What was the real sin of Eve? You could say disobedience. You could say this. You could say not trusting God. But at the root of the deception that the enemy used, he said, you don't know the knowledge of good and evil. So therefore, you are inadequate. You are not good enough. You need this knowledge. And thank God we all, or not thank God, but we all have the knowledge of evil every since. Right. And there's this, there's this insidious lie that says you're not good enough. So if you have a pattern in your life of trying to prove yourself over and over and over again, you're an overachiever. You are going to climb the ladder of success. And in our world, we applaud it. Oh, look how great they are. They're the new CEO. They're the new manager. They just got the promotion. Not that any of those things are wrong, but there could be, if you are an overachiever, there could be an underlying spider behind it that instead of doing it for the right reasons, you're doing it because internally, you're still trying to prove that you're good enough. And internally, I'm not good enough. And until you deal with that lie, you will run yourself ragged. You will keep trying to prove to the world that you're good enough, and it just doesn't, just doesn't work. How about this one? How about this one? There's a lie that says, I can't because. Now, you could add whatever you want at the end of that because. 
That is a lie from the pit of hell that starts to affect everything in our lives. So if you have a, a, a pattern of disobedience in your life, and that's what I'm going to call it because that's what it is, where God says, I want you to serve in this ministry. I want you to go to this thing. I want you to, 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 to share this with Jesus or share Jesus with this person. And, and God calls you to do something and you think, oh yeah, I want to do it. But then you walk out of the door and you say, I can't do it because blah, blah, blah. That is a lie from the enemy, but it starts to affect every one of us. You see this one throughout the Bible. Abraham and Sarah, Sarah laughed at God. She said, I can't have a child. I'm old. Now, in her defense, that is pretty comical. If I'm 100 years old or eight is 100 years old and God's like, you're going to have a child, I'm going to probably laugh at it. Maybe not in disrespect, but just because that's just funny, right? But, but, but she laughs at it because she says, I can't because. Moses is standing at the burning bush. God says repeatedly, I want you to go set my people free. And over and over and over, he makes excuses. I can't do this because I'm not a good speaker. I can't do this because... And we make these excuses. You see this again throughout the entire Bible over and over and over. You see this with the Israelites. They go into Canaan and, and they walk in and they, they see these mighty people that are there. They're huge people apparently. Giants in the land. And they come back and they said, we can't take the land because we are like grasshoppers to them. I can't do this because... Uh, Pastor Jamie Jones was speaking at, at, at our men's retreat this weekend, and he said something I thought was so good. He said, he said some of us have a case of the wood butts. And I'm like, what in the world? I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that one. He said, I would butt. I would, Pastor, but. I would do what God's called me to do, but. And sometimes we get those same wood butts in our church, right? I know God's called me to do this, but I can't do this because. I can't because blah, blah, blah. I don't have enough biblical education. I don't, I'm not a good enough speaker. I don't have enough secular education. Whatever it is, and you make every excuse in the world, so you end up missing out on what God has for you because of a lie that you've accepted and believed in yourself. How about this one? How about, how about I'm missing out? This is a lie. This is a big one, especially for younger folks in this room. Uh, the fear of missing out, FOMO, right? We get FOMO, the fear of missing out. So you've got to be involved in everything all the time. The Israelites faced this whenever they thought they had to have a king. We've got to be like every other nation. We're missing out because we don't have a king. They all have kings. Apparently, we're missing out on this thing. So God, give us a king. And God's like, you really don't want a king. It's not going to end well. But he's like, give us a king anyway. If you are the type of person that you cannot not, you can't say no to whatever it is, right? Uh, you can't say no to the party. You can't say no to the opportunity. You can't say no. You are always saying yes, and you end up burning yourself out with all the yeses, and you end up because every yes has a no that you're saying to somebody else, and so you end up saying yes to everything. It could be this 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 lie behind the scenes going, I'm, I'm missing out. If I say no to this, I'm going to miss something important, and so you're constantly saying yes over and over and over and over again. Um, you see this in all kinds of ways. How about this lie? This lie, and we see it a lot in our society today, everybody's against me. We're raising, we're raising a, a generation of victims right now. And so everybody's against me, and so you end up with this lie that I'm a victim. Everybody's against me. And you see people that they see the world in this perspective that every, every, every you know, when, back in the day it was the man, Nobody knew who the man was, but it was the man. And everybody is against me. But we're raising a whole generation right now that, that instead of owning it, that I am enough in Christ and I can make my own destiny and, 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 and the, the good side of the humanistic side of things, instead of looking at it that way, they get this idea that I am a victim and everybody's always against me. And, and it's a lie. It's the way we feel, but it's not the truth. All right, let's make it real personal. Can, can I just confess? Can I just share some of my own? And maybe I'll do some more of this during the series. Can y'all handle it if I be honest with you? So, so let me tell you one of my big lies that I have to face all the time. I have to kill this spider all the time in my life, and I'm not always successful. I'd love to tell you I was. You're unworthy. It's very similar to the you're not good enough one, but you're unworthy. Let me tell you how this played out last Sunday in our church. I'm going to give you an example. Last Sunday, this is like fresh, real, because I want you to know this is how it works. Last Sunday in our church, restoration room, God's moving, people are getting healed as frequently happens in restoration room. And I'm not even sure, 
I think there might have been more healings than what was uh, named because I'm not sure the restoration room healings got put on that list. But, but people are healed. Restoration room is over. I'm out in Main Street. And Rev Winfrey comes out and he says, Pastor Brent, this is so awesome. God just healed my ear. He said, I've been having this crackling noise in my ear for years. And whenever I get in loud music or loud you know, stuff, it crackles and it makes this noise. And God just healed my ear. Robert prayed for my ear and, and God just healed my ear. And I'm like, awesome. I've been having a crackling noise in my ear for years. Like, no kidding. When, when I first got in ministry 23, four years ago, uh, I, we were doing an outdoor service in front of... Um, what is now Sweet Bay in Plant City. We're doing an outdoor service and I had picked up a speaker, taking it down at, afterwards and put it up on my shoulder so the speaker is literally like at my ear. And, and somebody, I don't remember if they unplugged it real fast or, or they turned something up real fast, but they, it made a, like a giant loud noise right in my ear. And ever since then, for 23, 24 years, if I'm in a really loud room or if it uh, um, hits the right frequency, like I hear this cracking noise in my ear. It doesn't hurt, but I, hear, I feel a cracking noise in my ear and it's just kind of annoying. And, uh, and so Rev's like, hey, God just healed my ear. And I'm like, that's awesome. I have the same problem. I was not ready to take the next step because Rev says, well, let Robert pray for you too. <laughs> that's logical. Anybody in this room would do the same thing, right? God healed me of the same thing you have. I got cancer. Let me pray for you for cancer. This was my initial feeling inside. Now, of course, I can't show this. I can't show this because I'm the pastor. Y'all with me? I can't show you my spider. My initial first inward feeling was, I'm okay with it though, because I, I, I don't need God to heal me. I'm, on, I'm not worthy enough for God to heal. I can, I can pray for other people and God to heal them, but God, I, I can push through things. God built me like that. I'm a tough guy. Like I can push through things. I don't need God to heal me. I'll fight through it. And so Robert comes in and he starts to pray for me and you know, he does this whole thing, puts his hand on my ears and, and the whole thing. And, 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 and even as he's praying, in fact, they might've heard me. I kept saying, I am worthy to receive healing. I am worthy to receive healing. Isn't that weird? Why would I? I'm the pastor. I spent my whole adult life trying to serve the Lord. Why would I be unwill, uh, uh, unwilling to receive healing from God? I have prayed for, I, I mean, I'm not exaggerating, probably, probably hundreds of people over the years who have experienced some sort of healing over the years. God has used me to heal people, but all of a sudden when it comes to me, I'm not worthy, and I'm just good to press through. I don't, I don't really need healing. I can just press through. What, why? Why? What if there's a spider behind the scenes telling me you're unworthy? And some of you know that spider because he's very much a part of you. And there's these spiders, and they come in, and they make these webs all around us that end up binding us up and hurting us and keeping us from the very things that God wants us to do. Maybe, maybe the strongest spider, maybe the hardest one for anybody that has an addiction is this one. I can't change. So when it comes to change, when we talk about change, you're the one that starts to begin to think, I, I can't change. Because you tried for months. You tried for a long time. And then you get to the point that you stop trying to change because you believe I can't change. And it doesn't matter what anybody tells you on the outside. As long as you believe that lie and you are now partnering with that lie and you are with it, you will never change. Because you believe you won't change. And now we're being bilingual with a language that we should never be speaking. And then one moment we'll speak faith about somebody else or something else. And the next moment we're speaking doubt over our own selves. We could talk about the lie that, that God is mad at me. Any of those kind of things. Are y'all with me this morning? Because y'all are really quiet. I know we got a men's retreat hangover and all the men are like exhausted. But, but I hope you're getting something out of this. I know we're teaching. But we do this. We partner with these lies. And that ends up creating a web that makes us act differently than we should. Does that make sense? So what do we do? What do we do with these lies? Number three, if you're taking notes, we need to take every thought captive and interrogate it for honesty. <laughs> Take every thought captive and then interrogate it for honesty, right? So, so, so there's a famous verse that you've probably heard before. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says this. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. You want to know another way of saying it? We demolish every lie that sets itself up against the truth of God, right? So we're demolishing lies that set themselves up against the knowledge of God or the truth of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 
So I'm taking this, 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 this lie captive, and I'm saying this lie will, will now become a truth. I have to switch it. I, have to, I cannot believe this lie anymore. Now I have to start believing truth. Um, we could call this, um, in psychology, they talk about uh, a CBT or a, a, a cognitive behavioral therapy where you have to cognitively think, I'm not going to play off my emotions. I'm gonna, I know what my emotions feel like, but I'm going to cog- cognitively think, is this true? Is this actually true, what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking? I got to process it. I got to think about it. Is this true? And as believers, we're saying, does this line up with what the Word of God says, what the Word of God says about me, or am I partnering with another kingdom? Am I partnering with... So is this true? All right, y'all have been really generous and kind and sweet and quiet so far. So let me, um, let me show you actual footage of this happening. Now, I know we're like, what does that look like? Actual footage of what it looks like to expose a lie and replace it with truth, okay? Watch the screens. be dead. Huh? No, he's kidding. You stink. I think you're gonna have a good Christmas, all right? You smell like beef and cheese. You don't smell like Santa. Okay. He's a monster! He's a fake! He's a fake! He's a fake! That's real footage of what it looks like to now interrogate the idea that you have in your mind and say, is that truth or not? And when it's not truth, I'm going to expose it to the rest of the world. You're not Santa Claus. You are pretending to be something that's helping me, but you're not actually helping me. I'm no longer going to play this pretend game anymore. I'm going to expose the lie for truth. Are you all with me? Here's the thing about lies, and here's the thing also about spiders. Spiders are fast, and they are secretive. (laughs) They run around like crazy behind the scenes when you're not looking, and you don't even see them there. And all of a sudden, like, 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 like you see a spider and then, then like you get ready to kill the spider, but he's gone. And then sometimes if we're honest, we're thankful he's gone. Like as long as I don't see him out of sight, out of mind. Because spiders are fast and they're secretive. They hide behind everything. They want to sneak in the gaps of your life, the corners of your life. They want to be the thing that's behind the scenes that pretend they're not there while they keep... You ever notice you see cobwebs, but you never see the spiders in your house? But the cobwebs are evidence that there's spiders there. And so spiders like to be secretive and behind the scenes and they're fast it's like a, uh, in psychology, they talk about, in psychology, they talk about uh, ants, automatic negative thoughts. Ants, automatic negative thoughts. Anybody deal with ants? Like something happens, you just uh, instantly, it just goes negative, negative. You're not seeking in faith. You're just automatically, automatic negative thoughts that start to come into your mind. And it's funny, like if you ever try to kill a spider, like, like you ever, you ever, like I, I should have showed a video of like YouTube of like people killing spiders, right? You take your shoe off or whatever, and then you do this number. 
Because we want to kill the spider, but we don't want the spider jumping on us. And roaches aren't as fast, but spiders are fast and they jump. And it's like, you're, you're, you're doing the whole... You look, you look like a 16th century you know, sword fighter. You're a fencer. Trying to kill spiders behind the scene because they're secretive. And they're fast, right? That's what spiders are. And so we end up looking funny when we try to kill spiders. But until you get to the root, until you get to the very fundamental spider behind the scenes, you will keep having cobwebs in your life over and over and over and over again. So what do we do? We arrest them and we interrogate them. So we spot spiders over here, and we arrest them. I see you sneaking over here in the corners. We grab them. Get over here, spider. (laughs) And then we set them down, and we got to interrogate these spiders. So a lie has come out. Spider, you can turn that way. This will make it easier for you. So a spider has revealed itself because there's webs. So we are going to hunt down spiders in our life. The next four weeks in this church is all about hunting down the spiders in your life. They come so fast. They're secretive. They come. You believe them before you even catch yourself believing them. They know exactly where to hide in the crevices of your mind. And so they fight there and there's back and forth. It's like those automatic negative thoughts. And so now we're going to catch them and then we're going to interrogate them for truth. So I believe... I'm not worthy. You believe you're not good enough. You believe I can't because. And it goes by so fast you don't even catch yourself thinking it. Whoop, stop, let's catch them and let's begin. Is that true? Is that true that I can't because I didn't go to college? I can't because I've had a divorce. I can't because of these things. Is that true? I'm talking to the lie that is in my life that is causing cobwebs. Are you all with me? Is that true? Does it line up with the language of the kingdom of God? Now, sometimes you might find things that are true. Other times, and most of the time, when we're dealing with this area, you're going to consistently find things that are not true. So we want to kill the spiders because that's what we're doing, right? We are killing spiders. And how do you kill spiders? With spider spray, right? A spider spray called truth. And so you get the spiders, and they're scared to death of the truth. They'll do anything they can to hide from the truth. And you spray the web on them instead of them spraying the web on you. Aren't these spiders awesome? Thank you, guys. You guys are amazing spiders. Thank you. Y'all can, y'all can go back down. You're awesome. You're awesome. I'm glad that went well, because I'm like, some people are going to think I'm a child's a kid's pastor again or something. I don't know. The Holy Spirit will guide you in all truth. As you see spiders, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Put those two truth forms together and extinguish the spiders in your life. And all of a sudden, you start to find out my issue is not alcoholism. My issue is a root thing I believed as a child. My issue is not anger and being, being uh, road rage all the time. My issue is something that happened to me as a child and something I believed in that. And when you really start getting to the root causes and extinguishing those, those spiders, all of a sudden you find, I don't have to drink anymore. Not because I'm so powerful and I just denied it, but because I got to the root issue and I don't have to, I don't have to be controlled by this thing. All of a sudden, I don't have to be controlled by my anger. I don't have to be controlled by my lust. I don't have to be controlled by greed. I don't have to be controlled by these things anymore because you actually kill the spiders in your life. Uh, There's so many of them. There's so many of them. I'm going to give you a quick list. This is real fast. I'm just going to run through it real quick. But you might have the spider that says, I'm unworthy and I'm unacceptable. unacceptable. The truth is that I am accepted and worthy by God's standards. You might have the spider that says, I'm alone. Here's the truth. You are never alone. The Holy Spirit is always with you. And Deuteronomy says he'll never leave you or forsake you. You might have the lie that says, I feel like a failure. Listen, if you are following Jesus Christ, you are not a failure. That is not the truth. You might have the lie that says, I have no confidence. I can't do anything. I, I just uh, here, Here's the reason to have every confidence is the fact that Jesus lives in you and the Holy Spirit is in you. 
You can have the lie that says, I have no hope. Listen, we should be the people that are full of hope. Romans 15 says, then you will overflow with confidence and hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can have the lie that says, I'm not good enough for God to love me. But listen, you are being made perfect in Christ. You are good enough. Uh, Hebrews tells us you're being made perfect and God does love you. The most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. You might have the lie that says there's nothing special about me, but you forget that you're made in the very image of God. You might have the lie that says I don't have what I need, but, but Philippians says you have everything you need. You lack nothing in Jesus Christ. You might have the lie that says I'm weak, but, but, but Daniel tells us I am strong. You don't have the lie that says I'm defeated. No, you are victorious in Christ's name. Come on, y'all. You might have the lie that says, I'm addicted, but you are free in bondage. And as long as you believe you are addicted, as long as you believe that, you will keep operating out of that. You are partnering with these truths, but they're not true. They're oftentimes your feelings and what you've experienced in the past, past, but they're not true by God's word. You might have the lie that says, I have no father, but God is your father. You've never been alone. You've never been without a father. The fear of death. Some people live in bondage of fear of death, but you have an assurance of heaven. You crucify, you kill that spider in your life. So so how do we do that practically? How do we do that? Killing spiders. Confession plus renouncing plus rejecting plus replacing equals killing spiders. We're going to talk in specifics about this throughout the rest of this series, but let me give you a quick look at it. Confess. Agree with the confession that you believed a lie. Confess to the Lord, God, I have believed something that is not true. I'm no longer going to believe this, so I'm confessing it over to the Lord. That's where it all starts at, recognizing that the issue is there. And then I'm going to renounce it, meaning I'm going to renounce its hold on me. That lie can no longer hold me down. That lie can no longer, I'm not submitting myself to it any longer. I'm not partnering with it any longer. Then I'm going to reject the lie and refuse to believe them any longer. So so I'm rejecting this lie from now on. I'm no longer going to believe this lie. I am not going to accept it any longer. And then you replace it because if you just have a lie all by itself and you just reject it, now you got an empty spot with Jesus said causes more problem in the long run than, than, than in that moment. And so we replace it with the truth of God. So the lie is I'm not worthy. The truth is I am fully worthy in Jesus Christ. Are you with me? So we replace the lie with the truth. Replace the lie with the truth. You'll oftentimes have to do this more than once. It's, it's not something that just is going to be one time and over. You're going to have to keep killing spiders over and over. Just like I told you, uh, you know, last Sunday night in our church, I had to keep saying it out of my mouth. I am worthy to receive healing. I am worthy to. Re- and, and, and in this room, you'd all go, how stupid. Why would you feel unworthy? Here, it, it, it's, it's my spider. Your spider oftentimes won't make sense to other people. It's your background. It's your upbringing. It's your thing. And so that's how we kill spiders. Now, this whole series, I should say this way, today is a setup for the whole series. This is an intro. The next four weeks, predominantly, we're going to look at specific spiders in our life that a lot of us are going to be dealing with and how to kill those spiders, how to catch them, crucify them, how to catch them, uh, uh, interrogate them, find out if they're true or not, and then kill them if they are uh, 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 not true. And we're going to spend the rest of the time in this series doing that. I want to end with this thought that freedom or bondage is found in the lies and truth we believe. Many of us end up, live our lives in some form of bondage because we have accepted and attached ourselves to lies that were never truth in the first place. If you want to live in freedom, it is associated with the language of heaven of truth. It's associated with the kingdom culture of truth. And uh, uh, we have to be people of freedom And we have to be people that are willing to kill the spiders in our life. So here's the question for you as we wrap up. What spiders do you need to begin killing? What cobwebs show up in your life over and over and over? You're going to have a month's worth of homework. Because many of us have cobwebs. They're easy to find. Just look at the patterns. Look at what you've been dealing with your whole life. Same things. You've you've struggled in this area over and over and over. They're easy to find the cobwebs. Just like in your house. (laughs) It's easier to find cobwebs usually than it is the spider. But now we're going to take it deeper this whole month. And my challenge for you is to say it's not just about the cobweb. I'm going to find the spider behind it. Begin praying this month. Again, we're going to help you all during the month. But begin praying, God, 
what is the spider that's causing these patterns? What is the root lie that I've believed and I've partnered with that's causing these patterns in my life? If you get to the end of the month and you haven't really figured anything out yet, you know it's there, but you can't kind of can't get to it, sign up for a Sozo. Sozo specializes in that very thing. So sign up for a Sozo. It'll be powerful. It'll be awesome uh, for you to, to expose those lies in your life. Because I want us to live in freedom. Amen? <clears throat> I want us to live in freedom. Thank you for watching this message today. We ask that you hit the subscribe button and share this message on all social platforms. Man, we are hoping that you were encouraged and blessed by what you heard. And we cannot wait to see you next time.